Okay, thank you very much all for being here. Um, my name is Sasha Clement. I'm the founder and CTO of Gestigon. Um, I founded the company six years ago and I sold the company to the Valeo Group six months ago. Um, so I'm sort of in the integration phase of a team of 40 software engineers into a big corporate of more than 80,000 engineers right now. And, um, but I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about how we utilize the QT framework in our gesture control and behavior tracking software. So we're a software company. Um, we want to track human behavior in the automotive world in the car. So, and I'm spending, well, roughly one third of the talk about what we're actually doing, what we want to achieve, because the application we're addressing is sort of different to what we've seen um, today um, in, in the previous talk. So we're not talking about an infotainment system, system or a cluster, but we're talking about understanding if the driver and the passengers are safe in the car, if they pay attention to the road, if the hands are on the steering wheel, if driver and passenger can be brought in a safe way from A to B. And sort of this, this image visualizes the perfect world we want to achieve. So we want to understand if your wife and your daughter can get safe from, from A to B um, in this sort of sleeping way. Um, so when you look into what happens on the streets and how many accidents we have per year, uh, then we know for sure that it's 2.4% uh, of the fatal crashes are caused by drowsy drivers. Of course, these are much, much more, but these are the numbers where we are sure that the accident was caused by a drowsy driver. So 800 people are killed alone in the US per year by people falling asleep while driving, and 30,000 are injured. When you then take into account the numbers of um, how much damages to cars and, and other equipment are caused, these are huge numbers. But they get even huger when you look into distraction-affected crashes. Then it's not 2.4%, but then it's 10%. People texting on the phone, doing other stuff while driving. So more than 3,000 people in the US killed per year by people that do not pay attention to the road but do other things. And 430,000 that are injured, and it's billions of money that is uh, wasted by accidents where people um, drive in a distracted way. And then we have these things, people that do not sit in the car as they should. So here the, the airbag is occluded, which is, well, a hazardous sitting position um, and, and should be avoided. So here the question is, how can the car understand this? Is there a way to make the car aware that a user is not operating in a safe and, and, and reasonable way. And then there are two other topics. One is something that some of you might have faced. 50% of, of all drivers face something that is called repetitive driving injury. So it means when you enter the car, you drive for some hours, you feel neck pain afterwards, your back hurts, and this does not, call, does not happen once or twice, but almost every time you drive. So this is called repetitive driving injury, and this is mainly caused by the fact that most drivers do not adjust their, their, sit, their seat um, according to, to the best sitting position. Um, so there are studies that describe how bad a, a, a regular driver adjusts his seat, and if we would better understand the size of the driver and how he's sitting, we could adjust the seat automatically and, and avoid this repetitive driving injury. But the input data we need for all this is we need to understand the size of the driver, how is he sitting, where are his hands, what is he doing in the car. And finally, the ultimate thing to solve is, well, everybody knows this, um, you're stuck in traffic, you're getting angry, you're getting distracted by the traffic, you don't pay attention to the road in the way you should. And, um, well, we call this road rage. Um, you get upset and uh, you might cause a crash. Again, something where we would like to understand 
What is the mood the driver is in? What are the facial expressions? How is he behaving in the car? And Jessigan has developed in the last six years a method based on depth sensors to track the interior of the car. We started with gesture control. We've done this for a couple of markets, but we ended up in automotive because we found that automotive was the most critical well, scenario where behavior tracking would actually at the end save lives. So here we see an image processing um, uh, results. So we have the, the original input data. This is Niklas from our team. He is recorded by a 3D camera. We extract features from these images. We detect where his body parts are. Uh, we label them with colors. We understand his, his sitting position. And we finally get a skeleton result to understand um, if he's behaving correctly or if he's not. Um, or if he's not. Um, and when I'm talking about sensors, I'm talking always about 3D sensors. So we use today 3D sensors from a variety of, of, of different um, imaging paradigms. So we use stereo sensors, we use time of flight sensors, and we, we've also used structured light sensors. And in a car, there's not much space. So the question is, how can we record the interior of a car in a reasonable way? And I shown here three positions that today make a lot of sense. We're, well, every time we're having a project, we're negotiating with the customer, which might be a tier one or an OEM, what is the best position for the use case. But at the end, there will be some sensors in the car to, to understand what is happening in the car. One would be in the center stack. The center stack is a good position to understand gestures, to understand what is the driver doing with the infotainment system without touching it, something like, um, like a, an approach sensor. Um, then we have sensors in the dome module. Some of you might know the BMW 7 Series. It has a gesture control unit, unfortunately, from one of our competitors included, um, with a gesture control unit based on 3D sensors looking downwards, such that the gestures of the driver and the passenger can be recorded in this area in the, in the center console. And then we might have the region of the dashboard and the steering wheel where the driver is observed. These systems are today called driver monitoring systems. Most of them, most of them exclusively focus on the eyes of the driver to detect whether the eyes are closed or open to say, well, now he's falling asleep or not. But we're thinking beyond this. We're, we want to understand our hands on the steering wheel um, and what is the driver doing and not, not just if his eyes are closed. So here I showed some, some of the applications that we address today. Uh, so one is in the center console, gesture control, HMIs. Um, one is hands on steering wheel detection. So why do we need to understand if the hands are on the steering wheel? Well, the next level of driving is semi-autonomous or fully autonomous driving. And we're thinking about a system that automatically detects if the driver is having both hands on the steering wheel, but if not, the car should automatically take over. And even if we do a manual takeover, we need to understand if the driver is able to drive. And this is something that we can, um, where we, the detection of, of hands on the steering wheel is, is very helpful. And then the third um, region is the body pose and the head pose estimation, so from my, my line of sight from the direction that I'm looking at, um, I can already estimate to some extent whether I'm distracted or whether I'm paying attention to the road. And from my body pose, we can estimate, well, we should adjust probably the seating position or maybe the, the rear mirrors to better allow me the view around the car. And then one, one, one additional topic um, that is not related to the drug, the driver is um, seat occupancy. So today, there is no system that can detect whether a baby seat is correctly attached um, to, the, um, to the seat of, of the passenger. So um, we want to understand if there's a baby seat in the car, if there is a baby in the baby seat, and if everything is, cor is correctly installed uh, in the vehicle. And when we started with this, um, 
we had to, to decide upon a lot of different things. So first, in, in automotive, um, we're in a classic development world. Of course, we always like to develop agile software, but when it comes to testing, verification, validation, we get often stuck in the classic software development process that takes years until you get a final automotive qualified result. So we had to struggle with rapid prototyping in early stages versus some classic software valid validation processes as we know them from the automotive um, validation world. Um, and then we have a very complex image processing tool chain. So I mentioned a lot of different use cases and we at Gestion, we have one single framework addressing all these use cases. So we, we needed a solution that is flexible to allow reusable components for the different, um, for the different tool chains um, that we need, for example, for seat occupancy detection or for um, head pose estimation. So we have numerous plugins in our framework with hundreds and thousands of parameters um, and all need to ma be managed in a unified way. Um, and then immediate feedback is requested, so that this means once we change parameters in our system, in our image processing system, we want to get feedback on the results. How much better or worse is it with these, with these changes? So we cannot restart an application every time we change a parameter, but this needs to be done online. Um, and then there's one wording um, from, from the automotive world design to cost principle, which means um, we design the system and later on reduce the costs again and again to finally fulfill our customer needs. And so in this case, we need to trade off sometimes accuracy versus runtime, usability versus reusability. And a lot of components need to be trade off against costs. Um, and again, we needed a rapid prototyping framework um, to allow for this. And then the last two points are more for the, for the architecture of the whole, of the final system. Um, often we have, at least for the systems that we develop, we have no embedded system in, 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 in the car with an operating system, but we work on a bare metal implementation. We need to be able to configure our framework somewhere else and then finally upload the stripped down version to the bare metal, um, bare metal uh, system. And of course, licensing and certification constraints are, are uh, a, big, a big trouble in, in automotive. Um, well, certification uh, ISO 262662 has been mentioned before. Uh, the system that we're building will at the end allow to track the head of the driver and therefore better trigger an airbag. So this is definitely safety relevant on the highest level. So the software itself needs to be certified according to highest standards and all the systems around as well. So everybody is aware of this, the safety critical issue and the software architecture needs to address this. And well, we've been using Qt for, since the beginning I would say, um, because it w with this we were able to solve all the, all the issues that I mentioned before. So we use Qt for rapid prototyping and for visual debugging, so our image processing tool chain is based on plugins. Each plugin has a Qt interface um, and uh, allows to change every parameter on the fly. We have a lot of configuration tools. Um, at the beginning we have a camera image. Of course the camera needs to be calibrated. This is a Qt um, tool that we developed. We need to record and annotate data. So we have our framework relies on machine learning and deep learning, so we need hundreds and thousands of data streams that describe or that record data in the car, and we need efficient tools for this. So tooling of the data recording process was um, one of the major um, starting points where we, where we used Qt, and we always use it on, on PC platforms. But where we don't use Qt today is on the target embedded plot platform, as I mentioned before, um, these systems are, well, designed to cost and every library I can discard, every interface I do not have to implement on the embedded platform means a few cents or a euro less in costs and that's 
That's really important. And we don't use Qt integrated into our customer projects. We regard ourselves always as a middleware company. So we're developing the software from getting the image from the sensor up to sending a signal through the CAN bus um, to whatsoever system in the car. So in general, we have no front end to, to the final customer. So this is a short overview of the architecture. Um, we have a, an engine that organizes the, the, the image processing flow um, in, in plugins. Um, so we have some for pre-processing, segmentation, um, some for visualization. And on top of this, we have the customized software development kits for each car series, for each prototype, for each customer. And now getting a bit deeper into what we exactly do with Qt, um, our plugin architecture is, I would call, hybrid. So it has two states. One state is um, a configuration state, rapid prototyping stage, where each plugin looks roughly like this, um, has a lot of parameters, it reports its stage, so green means this event is fired, red means there is an issue, and yellow means, well, it might be fired in the future. Um, so we have uh, an online visual debugging, and each plugin has its own, um, own interface, but all look the same. Um, and we split processing into visualization, and with this split, we achieve that on the embedded target platform, we only have the processing part, and on the, um, on the PC and debugging interface, we might also have the visualization platform. Um, so the most important thing here was to reduce development time. So not every single engineer has to rethink how to structure his plugin, but the plug plugins have a unified structure. The interface is always the same. Of course, the parameters are different, but the structure is the same. And um, the architecture is designed once and for all plugins. And then, um, but design, how, how do we do this, this, this plugin configuration? So once we develop a new plugin, um, well, we, are, we tend to use an existing plugin and copy paste from what is existing and then change a bit. And that's the worst of the worst. So um, we have hundreds of plugins with thousands of parameters. Of course, there are co code duplicates. Nobody wants to have this. When you copy this and change things, you will have copy-paste errors. This is the, uh, the most common um, bug source um, that we had in the past and, and uh, that a lot of others are aware of as well. And manual coding is very error-prone. So wherever we could do some code generation, automatic code generation, um, we, try to, we try to do this. And the last point here is also coding style con deviations are in a grown system like ours. It has grown since six years. So the people who started with this had another coding style in mind than we use it today. So the more we can generate the code, the less coding, devia or coding style deviations um, we're going to have and the less people will complain about the style of code. So our solution is to use the Qt Creator to just design the visual layout and then do a lot of automatic code generation also for the image processing part. So we know that each plugin gets some input data. We can automatically generate the, the, the required input data from the parameters we have here. We can generate all member variables, we can de de um, generate all signals and slots and also the connections to other plugins. So we try to generate as much code as possible to let allow the, to allow the, the developers to concentrate on the image processing part. Most of the team are image processing specialists. They are machine and deep learning specialists. They should focus on what they do best or what they're best in and should not focus too much on the visualization front ends, but they should be uh, as unified as, as possible. So at the end, we get a configuration file out of this that can be encrypted or non-encrypted depending on, on the needs. So in, in automotive, we're 
We're used to sending raw messages through CAN interfaces. They're often non-encrypted. And we're hoping that this will change in the future that, well, security risks in a car um, can, can be handled. So we're, we're providing a mode where we're not sending human readable configuration files around, but where everything is encrypted. And this is also uh, managed by the code generation phase. Then regarding the tools we have, uh, well, at the end they look pretty simple, um, but the issue with the data we record is always synchronization. The sensors we use have multiple data streams. They need to be synchronized. Sometimes we have multiple cameras in the car. Multiple cameras need to be synchronized. Calibration needs to be done for each of it. And we have for 3D data, we have at least depth data, which is up here. So it's just the distance to each pixel. We have amplitude data, which is sort of the intensity of that pixel. And we might have a 3D point cloud, which is X, Y, Z coordinates of every single pixel. And we might have additional, uh, maybe sometimes RGB information, and everything needs to be synchronized. Here we're using OpenGL, uh, the QOpenGL widget, to, to visualize this in, in this very simple form. It's, it's totally sufficient. And of course, we have some pre-analytic tools to analyze uh, how much uh, noise do we have in the data, what is the region that we're looking at, um, so some, some convenience tools. But the main focus of these tools is to simplify the data recording and analysis process. So imagine you're not recording once or twice a stream, but hundreds and thousands of times in a car in a, in a convenient way, then the tool needs to be very, work very efficiently and where you store the data needs to be um, designed in a clever way. Um, then one of the, the last things is something that we call a pipeline configurator. So I've talked about plugins and a tool chain. So the plugins we have need to be organized in a clever way. Some may run in parallel. Some have complex dependencies, so we designed our own um, visual configuration interface based on the QGraphics scene. Um, and you see some of these hundreds of plugins on the left. Um, they can be dragged and dropped together, and we get error messages once some specific inputs are missing or if the outputs are not connected. So this helps a lot to reduce development times and, and help in the rapid prototyping phase. Um, the next thing that we found is Qt is very good for the graphical user interface, at least for, for what we do, um, has a nice multi-window handling, but um, we found that some of our prototypes were better visualized if we used a gaming engine. And some of our customers requested this as well, so we had to somehow connect the configuration interface of Qt with uh, a visualization of Unity. And we did this, this is a very simple visualization of this, so we have the raw data here, and we have a skeleton visualization of that on the right. So we developed a proprietary interface, which is shared memory based. We're sending rendering commands from Qt to Unity. Uh, we're, we're visualizing this in Unity, and then we're hijacking the Unity window and putting this into the Qt the Q application. So using the standard Windows API functions and the, uh, the Q window um, constructor, um, we can get everything into one application. So we're taking the best of both worlds, um, the configuration interface that we use in Qt and the 3D visualization in, uh, from Unity. And then as a last thing, uh, uh, an exotic use case we developed uh, a few years ago. Um, there we had to develop a gesture-enabled application launcher. So um, this application was you were pointing towards the screen and you could drag into a direction to open one of the applications on the screen. Um, and here we used, well, a very simple queue label. Uh, we made it transparent. And the biggest issue with this was getting all the parameters of the window manager right to make it transparent, that you can click through it, that it's overlaid on top of all other applications and that it doesn't interfere with, with the existing background. This is sort of the, the most exotic use case we had for, for Qt in the last years. Um, but at the end, it was well, at, an application launcher um, that you could connect to, to our sensors. That's basically all I wanted to tell you. Um, 
a few aspects of how we use um, Qt for gesture control and human behavior tracking. It's mainly about getting the pipeline of image processing components right and designing the architecture with help of Qt and designing the tools and methods around with, with nice Qt tools. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>